Our speaker is Dr. David Goldfield, Robert Lee Bailey, Professor of History at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and the author of the widely acclaimed America Flame, How the Civil War Created a Nation, the first major new reinterpretation of the US Civil War since James McPherson's battle cry of freedom. Goldfield serves as an academic advisor to the US State Department and sits on the advisory board of the Lincoln Prize. He is also a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Please welcome him to Minnesota. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle. It's a great pleasure to be in St. Paul. When I uh, was living and going to school in Washington, D.C., I saw the uh, Washington senators uh, depart for this area, and I vowed I would never be here. <laughs> well, now, of course, Washington has a major league baseball team, and uh, you guys don't. Okay, I, I think the, um, the first rule of public speaking is ingratiate yourself with the audience, and uh, so I think I've, uh, I've just broken that. Uh, but I really want to thank uh, Danielle Dart and the folks at the uh, Minnesota History Center for their great hospitality and making all of these arrangements, and I particularly want to thank you for coming out this, this morning. Uh, Danielle did promise me that there would be no snow, and uh, she, she's absolutely correct. You know, a few years ago, uh, when I was in the midst of writing this book, one of my colleagues came to me uh, and said, uh, Goldfield, what are you working on? And I said, I'm writing a book on the Civil War. And she said, oh, that's original. <laughs> well, well, you know, it, it, there's been about one book a day written on the Civil War since the Civil War ended. I mean, if you, you put them all around, they would uh, go right around the earth. I mean, that's how many books written about the Civil War. So what new can you say about the war? Well, for the past 50 years, we have had the following interpretation of the war. And, of course, it's epitomized, as uh, Danielle indicated, by uh, James McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom. And the story goes something like this. Slavery caused the Civil War. The Civil War itself, though bloody, produced two wonderful results, the liberation of four million human beings and the salvation of the Union. And the Reconstruction period that followed the war was a failure in that it failed to give the freedmen, those liberated by the war, the basic rights of American citizenship. Now, there's nothing really wrong with that interpretation, but as I started to study the conflict, and I approached it from the perspective as a Southern historian, that's uh, how I was uh, trained and that's where I'm uh, from, it occurred to me uh, that it was, in fact, incomplete. Uh, the question really isn't uh, whether slavery caused the Civil War. The question is why? Because we had slavery in this country for almost 250 years prior to the Civil War, and certainly since the start of our nation in 1776. But why in 1861 did slavery cause this conflict? And as far as the results of the Civil War, uh, it became apparent to me that the results of the Civil War, their liberation of four million human beings and the salvation of the Union, were not exactly as advertised, and we'll see what I mean uh, in a few moments. I also discovered that uh, the reason why slavery became such a difficult issue in the political process is that the political process itself was poisoned. Our government governs best through moderation. Our government governs best through compromise. That's the basis of our democratic system. We have a balance of powers uh, between the three branches of government. I mean, you've all taken your civics courses. You know all of that. Uh, and we're supposed to reach a conclusion based upon consensus. Our government does not function well when the extremes 
take over. Our government does not function well when the center erodes. Well, why did the center erode in the decades and the years before the American Civil War? It eroded primarily because religion entered the political process. Now, of course, religion is always a part of American life. We are the most religious country in the Western world. Uh, so faith is always part of our lives and sometimes part of our government. But uh, if you look at the many words of the Constitution, God is not one of them, not in there. Our founding fathers deliberately framed a government that was a secular institution. Uh, in 1850, during the debates over the Compromise of 1850, William Seward, senator from New York, stood on the floor of the Senate and says, there is a higher law than the Constitution. And that's, of course, where we get into a great deal of trouble. In a nation of laws, the basic document the basic frame of our government is the Constitution. It's not the Bible. Because my interpretation of the Bible may be different from yours, and we may have 350 different interpretations out there. And plus the fact that many of our citizens today uh, do not consider the Bible as their particular holy book. So the difficulty of injecting religion into the political process is that it tends to polarize issues. Issues are no longer debated on the basis of their merits. They are, basis, they are debated on the basis of their morality. So your opponent is not merely misinformed or misguided. Your opponent is evil. And how do you compromise with evil? You don't. You don't. And so uh, as the religious process intruded itself into the federal government, particularly after 1854 and the founding of the Republican Party, it became the home of many of the evangelical Christians arising out of the Second Great Awakening, the political process tended to move to the extremes. Now, I'm not letting uh, my fellow Southerners off the hook here because they too participated uh, in, in this uh, as well. But you'll see from my book that they consistently emphasize the fact that, yeah, uh, religion is important, but it should be separated from politics. So let's take a look at this process and then we'll talk about the war itself. In the early 19th century, the Second Great Awakening swept across the country, all parts of the country, northeast, south, and west. Uh, and it grew the evangelical denominations, the Presbyterians, uh, the Baptists, and the largest group, the, the Methodists. And the message was very simple. If you give your life over to Jesus Christ, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will be saved. It was a very simple, beautiful message, uh, particularly for a society that was tremendously mobile uh, because uh, many people migrated. Of course, uh, Lincoln's family, uh, Jefferson Davis's family, they all migrated from other parts of the country. The Lincoln family started way up in Massachusetts and then eventually came down from Virginia to Virginia and uh, into uh, Kentucky and then into Indiana and, and Illinois. Uh, and so people were separated from their families, they were separated from their communities, and they reformed these communities on the frontier through their churches. And so the Second Great Awakening was a, a way of reforming communities. It was a way of connecting not only with your families, but a way of connecting with your neighbors as well. So it became an integral part uh, of the lives of, of people. And as I said, the message was very simple. You didn't need uh, a college education, advanced degree to uh, understand it. And many of the preachers, in fact, uh, were relatively uneducated. However, as uh, evangelical Protestantism swept across the land, 
there was a concern that maybe um, the intrusion of this religion into the political process might not be such a good thing and might not even be constitutional. So a Baptist church in Danbury, Connecticut, sent a letter to the author of the First Amendment to the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson. Wouldn't it be great if we could send an email to the Founding Fathers and say, what did you mean by this? What exactly did you mean? Of course, my, my students asked me for Thomas Jefferson's email address. But, uh, but you know, like Lincoln got shot while he was watching a movie. So uh, th this uh, Baptist church in Danbury, Connecticut, um, sent them a letter, Thomas Jefferson a letter. What exactly did you mean uh, by this um, uh, First Amendment? Uh, and so Thomas Jefferson wrote back, uh, and he said, uh, as it says in the Constitution, he wrote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohib prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, well, that's kind of a legalese. What, what does that mean? And he said, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Is that as bad as explicit as you can get? Uh, th there, there is no room for interpretation there. A wall of separation between church and state. And that's from the author. You, you know, some Supreme Court justices uh, are uh, what they call originists. That, that, that is, they like to go back to what the founding fathers meant. Well, uh, if you interpret uh, the Constitution that way, then certainly you interpret the First Amendment as creating this wall of separation between church and state. And Jefferson did this for good reason. Uh, the, the good reason uh, was that he felt uh, that because we were such a pluralistic society, uh, there were many different religions, there were many different denominations, there were many different sects, that you could not accommodate them in the political arena if you started to throw up religious tests or you started to have an orthodoxy about public policy that reflected one particular religious perspective. So Jefferson felt, uh, and of course many with him, uh, that there was a strict separation between church and state. Now, w what's wrong with this picture? This is a picture of a nun by the name of Maria Monk and she's holding her child. What's wrong with that picture? <laughs> yeah, nuns are not supposed to have children, right? Well, uh, therein lies a very interesting story. And uh, let me read briefly. I start the book with the disappearance of a nun. Now, you may be wondering, what in the world does a disappearing nun have to do with the Civil War? Well, as it turns out, a lot. Convent life no longer suited Sister Mary John. Born Elizabeth Harrison in Philadelphia, she had converted to the Catholic faith and entered the Ursuline Order at the age of 18 in 1824. By all accounts, Sister Mary John was a gifted teacher and musician. Now... In the sweltering summer of 1834, at the Orders Convent School in Charlestown, Massachusetts, she walked out. The, the oppressive heat, teaching 14 45-minute lessons a day, conducting music classes, and attending to administrative duties as the mother assistant became overwhelming. She needed some time off. Well, about this time, I'll get back to uh, Sister Mary John in a moment. About this time, uh, Maria Monk uh, published uh, a book where she explains how she got that child. And it became an immediate bestseller. In fact, it was the biggest selling book in America until 1852 when Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. You probably have heard, obviously, of Uncle Tom's Cabin, but you probably haven't heard of this book, The Awful Disclosures of the Hotel du Nunnery, 
uh, which was second to uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin in terms of sales. Well, well, what did Maria Monk say? How she got that child? Well, she entered the convent, uh, and in that convent, she took her vows, and on the night that she became a nun at the ceremony, uh, she was ordered into a room and ordered to lie down in a coffin. And then three priests came in, and they ravished her. Now, I'm, I'm thinking, I've never been in a coffin, but, you know, four people doing that sort of thing in a coffin, you know, you got a little, I mean, I'm trying to picture it, you know. It, it, it just doesn't work for me. Uh, but anyway, that's how she got her, her child. But then she takes her re the reader on a tour of the convent, and she goes down into the basement of the convent, and there she pulls up some floorboards, and underneath the floorboards is a lime pit with the bones of hundreds of aborted infants. Now, it's a sensational book. There is one problem, however. Everything in it is false. But, you know, she wrote a sequel that was equally as popular. I know this is going to come as a great surprise to you, but sometimes Americans will believe things regardless of the facts. <laughs> just, just amazing. And so they sent a delegation uh, to this uh, nunnery and for one thing, this nunnery did not have a basement. Th that was for starters. So there was no lime pit. And the mother superior said, well, we don't allow priests in here. This is just for women. It came out later that actually uh, Maria Monk uh, had an affair with a Methodist minister. <laughs> and that's how she got that, that child. But the popularity of, of, of the book uh, emphasizes uh, something that I talk a great deal about in the uh, first part of the book, a and that is the growing concern in this country about the Roman Catholic Church. Because it was secretive, because you did all sorts of things, uh, and it was in Latin, and uh, all, all these things made it mysterious. And sometimes Americans, if they don't understand something, they'll attack it as foreign and somehow subversive. Well, the problem Americans, particularly evangelical Americans, had with, with Catholics uh, was that they felt that immigrants coming to America, and there was quite a flow from Ireland, by this time, by the 1830s, and accelerated, of course, with the potato famine in the, uh, in the 1840s, that these immigrants would owe their allegiance not to the President of the United States, but to the Vatican, to the Pope at the Vatican. And not only that, but a democracy depends on an educated and informed electorate. Well, these uh, Roman Catholics will just vote how their priests tell them how to vote. And so they will not have minds of their own to make up their own minds to vote for whomever the best candidate happens to be. So Lyman Beecher, the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, uproots its family from New England and moves the entire family to Cincinnati, which is at the time a raw, in the 1830s, a raw frontier uh, town. And he does this to establish a seminary. And he writes a book called Plea for the West. And I recommend it to you if, if you like that sort of thing, uh, which is probably the most scurrilous anti-Catholic screed ever published in this country. Uh, and um, why Cincinnati? Well, there was a rumor. There was a rumor rife at the time. 
And this rumor, incidentally, resurfaced in 1960 when uh, John F. Kennedy ran for president. There was a rumor rife at the time that the Pope was coming to America to establish an American beachhead, and he would make his headquarters in Cincinnati. <laughs> now, I, I don't know the Pope, but I think he has better taste than... <laughs> I, I mean... He, he, you know, now Cincinnati is, is okay. I mean, I love the chili, but, you, you know, in the 1830s, it was a pretty raw frontier town. I mean, you want to pick Boston or, or New York, or, but, but Cincinnati. But, again, uh, sometimes Americans believe in these conspiracy theories. I know that co comes as a shock to you, but we, we sometimes do. Uh, now... He rushed back when he heard about the disappearance of Sister Mary John. Remember, I opened with Sister Mary John. When he heard about the disappearance of Mary John, Sister Mary John, he rushed back to Boston and preached fiery sermons about what goes on in the convent where Sister Mary John was a teacher. Now, an interesting thing about this convent in Charlestown, Massachusetts, two interesting things, actually. First, there were 60 girls as students. Fifty of the girls were Protestant. Now, what were 50 Protestant girls doing in a convent school? Well, it was not until 1827 that uh, Boston allowed girls to attend public school. And even then they followed a separate curriculum from the boys. Uh, their curriculum was, I suppose we would call it domestic science today. They learned how to cook. They learned how to sew. Uh, they may have taken uh, piano lessons. The Catholic schools were the only places where girls could get an academic education. They studied literature. They studied science. They studied history. So that's what... Fifty Protestant girls were doing at this convent school in Charlestown, Massachusetts. But Lyman Beecher was convinced that something was going on here. For one thing, you had women in positions of authority in this convent, right? They were, it was all run by, uh, by women. And these women uh, were uh, unmarried, and they, which is an unnatural condition for women at that, that time. So they were leaders, they were administrators, they were teachers, they were doing things that women probably shouldn't be doing. And not only that, but there were Protestant girls. And you know what happens when Protestant girls go to Catholic schools. I have no idea. <laughs> but, but Lyman Beecher had, had, uh, had, an, had an idea. And... and the idea was they're all going to become Catholics. And, you know, we can't let that happen. Uh, I mean, it's bad enough these French guys are coming down from Canada and uh, trying to convert the folks on the frontier and the Indians and folks like that. But, uh, you know, to do it with these innocent girls, and, and God knows what will happen to these girls once they're enrolled in the, uh, in the Catholic Church, they'll be just lost, lost forever. So, he incites a mob of Protestant working men, and they burn the convent to the ground. Fortunately, uh, the Mother Superior got all of the students out uh, in time, so nobody was uh, killed or even, uh, even injured. There, there was one amusing incident, uh, part of the mob, you know, they, they knew about Maria Monk, of course, and so they went down, and this convent did have a basement, uh, and so they went down to the basement, and the basement is where they interred the nuns who had died in the convent, and so they uh, ripped open uh, all of the coffins expecting to find uh, aborted uh, infants, and they just found the remains of the um, nuns who had uh, died there. I mean, it, it, not an amusing incident, but it just goes to show you the, uh, the type of information that uh, tended to incite uh, these mobs. Now, this 
growing anti-Catholic fervor coincided uh, with the beginnings of the westward movement. Uh, the first families trekked uh, to the Oregon Territory in 1840, and it continued on uh, for the next uh, 20 years. And this is a depiction uh, of these early migrations. Uh, this is by Emanuel Leutze, uh, a German immigrant who painted this. Uh, it's called uh, Westward Ho or Westward the Course of Empire. It's known by two uh, titles. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, a, a rock. And you can see um, there are uh, two, uh, one man is climbing up and the other man is uh, waving his hat on top of it. If you look uh, just below the man who's climbing, you can see the cross on there. This was a holy endeavor. This was a holy odyssey, a holy migration. Because uh, part of the evangelical ideal uh, was that America was God's chosen country and that we were destined to conquer a continent from sea to shining sea. In fact, we even called it Manifest Destiny. Of course, there were some people in the way uh, of that uh, conquest. Uh, one of them, uh, one group of people, uh, Native Americans, uh, Indians, but uh, they had no discernible religion or at least uh, a religion that white Europeans could understand. Uh, so they uh, were not very important. And the other folks were Mexicans. And what religion were Mexicans? Yeah, right, they were Roman Catholic. So uh, it's good to uh, uh, beat on them. And, and, and in fact, <laughs> we um, started a war against uh, Mexico in 1846. And you know, incidentally, and I m mentioned this in, in the book, that war against Mexico in 1846 was notable because you had 2,000 uh, Irish Catholic American troops desert over to the Mexican side because of this anti-Catholic uh, fervor. So uh, that was interesting. Would come into play again in the in the Civil War because Jefferson Davis tried to entice the uh, uh, the Irish to come over to the uh, Confederate side. But but uh, uh, keep this uh, in mind. Now, in, in 1848, there were revolutions all over Europe, uh, toppling autocratic regimes. This happens to be uh, the one in, in Paris, but it occurred in the German states, uh, in the Italian states, uh, in Austria, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, just all over uh, Europe. And Americans were very excited. They were extremely excited uh, uh, about this. Uh, and uh, I, I know this is not necessarily the case today, but Americans were really interested in affairs in, in Europe uh, at, at the time. Uh, part of it was the idea, hey, you know, we're a lonely experiment here. We're the only country in the world with this form of government, government by the consent of the, uh, of the governed. Wouldn't it be nice if there were other countries like us and, and that's why these revolutions were so exciting because now the people of these countries were taking control and they were going to follow our example. Unfortunately, what happened was that all of these revolutions collapsed. And in fact, the governments that replaced the regimes against which the revolutions were fought, were sometimes more autocratic, more totalitarian than the old governments. And this was a tremendous disappointment uh, to uh, Americans. And you, you get the rhetoric, and the writings, and the speeches that our American experiment is fragile. It's very difficult to maintain a government by the consent of the government. Power corrupts, and it's so easily put together in the wrong hands. So Americans were very concerned about this as we entered the 1850s, even more concerned because by this time, uh, these evangelical forces had become part of the political process. Beginning in 1840, every four years presidential election, you had a different evangelical party. And almost all of these evangelical parties emphasized the same 
two principles. One, against slavery in the territories, that they were anti-slavery, and two, against Roman Catholic immigration and the Roman Catholic Church more generally. So these two themes of evangelical Protestantism came together. And they came together on the streets of American cities, particularly at election time. You know, the Irish potato famine in 1847 and 1848 brought one million Irish immigrants. This, now, one million doesn't sound like, in, in today's population, doesn't sound like much. But we were a pretty small country in the 1840s and 50s. And suddenly to absorb one million immigrants, that was quite a bit, and it, and it created a, a tremendous amount of tension in, in, the, uh, in the cities. And this is a depiction uh, of uh, one of the worst riots. It occurred July 4th, uh, 1857 uh, in New York City, and it was immortalized in Martin Scorsese's movie, Gangs of New York, where Protestant and Catholic gangs battled uh, each other. Uh, and it became part of the political process, because by this time, the uh, Irish Catholics were identified with the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was identified as the party of immigrants. And the Republican Party was the evangelical party, and they were the par party of the white Protestant working men. And here's a cartoon by uh, Thomas Nast, a, another German immigrant, a Protestant German immigrant. And you can see the anti-Catholic sentiment uh, in this cartoon. Uh, there are some crocodiles coming ashore. But if you look closely, these are not crocodiles. They're prelates of the Roman Catholic Church. And they're coming to take our children. Now, in the distance, you see this domed building. Uh, it, it's not the Capitol building, but it is the Vatican. And you can't see it, but trust me, it's on the facade. On the facade is inscribed two words, Tammany Hall. <laughs> now, I've been to the Vatican, and I have not seen those words. <laughs> I, can, I can report to you. And some of you have been to the Vatican, and you probably didn't see that either. Well, Tammany Hall was, of course, the Democratic Party machine in New York City. Uh, and basically what this Republican cartoon was saying uh, is that the Democrats are subversive. The Democrats want to undermine our country, want to establish and install an alien presence, an alien government, an authoritarian, totalitarian, hierarchical government over our country. And that's what the Democratic Party uh, is about. And so the American Patriot published it's a newspaper of a party called the Know Nothing Party, which was formed in 1853. It was the first time in American history a political party had been formed against a particular religion or a particular group. They were called Know Nothings because it was a secret organization, and if you walked up to somebody and said, are you a member of the, 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 this party? They would say, I know nothing. But it, it was a good um, example of their intellect, too. Um, <laughs> the, and you can see here in, in this newspaper, they are opposed to papal aggression and Roman Catholicism. Just states right out. In the book, I have a quote from uh, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer. And the Philadelphia Inquirer is a major newspaper at the time, still, still is a, a major newspaper, uh, where the editor says, we need to exterminate Catholics. Just, just comes right out and, and says that. We need to exterminate Catholics. Uh, opposed to foreigners holding office, uh, raising foreign military companies in the U.S., opposed to nunneries and the Jesuits, of course. Um, so this 
tremendous anti-Catholic sentiment. And you know, in the literature on the, on the Civil War, you don't read much about, about this. It's always slavery, slavery, slavery. But I tell you, if you walk down the street of New York, if you walk down the streets of Philadelphia or of Boston or Baltimore or Chicago at this time period, and you would have stopped somebody and said, well, what's the most the issue of most concern to you? Many of them would have said, depending on their religion, oh, it's the Protestants or it's the Catholics. This was a great concern uh, to, to Americans because the honest truth is most white Americans did not care about slavery one way or the other. They did not care about black people one way or the other. I mean, Cincinnati passed an, a, a law banning African Americans from their city. In fact, many had to flee to, uh, flee to Canada. So uh, to look upon this as uh, a racial conflict, uh, again, tells only part of the story. And then from many of these know-nothings moved into a new political party called the Republican Party. And here we have the merger of these two strains of evangelical thought, that is anti-slavery and uh, anti-Catholic. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, this uh, you can see is Abraham Lincoln, and he's debating Stephen A. Douglas in 1858 in the Illinois Senate race uh, that year. And the official slogan of the Republican Party in 1858 in Illinois was vanquish the twin despotisms, slavery and Catholicism. Again, the merger, the marriage of these two issues. And I, I want to make very clear, Lincoln was not a religious bigot. He abhorred the anti-Catholic wing of the Republican Party. But as we all know, sometimes you got to appeal to your base, <laughs> even if you don't believe it yourself. Well, in 1860, the Republicans uh, ran Abraham Lincoln, as we all know, for, for president. And there were several hundred thousand uh, young men called the Wide Awakes. And they would march through streets of, of major cities in the country, uh, usually from about 10 p.m. To, to midnight, bearing torches. They wore black oil cloth capes. It was almost uh, military uh, in their procession, and they would sing hymns. And you got the feeling that th this wasn't a political rally. This was a movement. And of course, as we all know, the Republicans were uh, victorious, uh, and Lincoln, you can see here, uh, he is campaigning, uh, obviously, in a church, uh, and he's really, really getting into it. The fellow sitting behind him in the blue suit is Henry Ward Beecher, uh, the son of Lyman Beecher, the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, and probably the leading evangelist of the, uh, of the time. And uh, this was a campaign poster uh, for the 1860 presidential campaign. And basically, it was to say to the base of the Republican Party, look, I know, uh, you know, Lincoln is not really one of us, but, you know, he really has his heart in the right place. Look, he's, he's in the Plymouth Church in Brooklyn, which was the largest evangelical church in America at, at the time. And uh, he, obviously, he's, uh, he's okay. You can, you can trust him. There's one thing wrong with this poster, however. Lincoln never appeared at the Plymouth Church. Now, I know this is a surprise to you that sometimes campaigns lie. <laughs> we don't do that today, but you know, back in the 19th century, their standards were obviously lower. Uh, in, in fact, Lincoln never left Springfield, Illinois. So he was nowhere near Brooklyn. But again, this was an opportunity. And we didn't have TV back then, so we couldn't have... Uh, reporters chasing after him. Uh, this was a way of saying, hey, Lincoln is one of us. So the war came. And here's a depiction, once again, from Thomas Nast. Nast was not only a, a great political cartoonist, he was also a wonderful uh, painter. 
Uh, and uh, this is at the start of the war. And uh, I know with, with the slide, you can't see it very well, uh, but these are Union soldiers in the foreground. But they're not wearing Union uniforms. They are wearing the uniforms of crusaders. They're coming to liberate America from evil. And they're going off. And you can see in the distance, with the sun radiating, uh, that's a depiction of the Capitol building, but it's sort of a religious depiction. It almost looks like a cathedral, right? Uh, and that's the ultimate goal, to establish this regime over America. Now, of course, there are other things going on as well. And one of the things I do in the book, I also talk about the Indian Wars. Because I think there, when you read books about the Civil War, uh, the Native Americans are, are pretty invisible. But I think this is part of one piece. Because we had this righteous view that this is our country, and if you're not part of it, if you're not part of this dominant religion, uh, and dominant ideal, then uh, you are certainly subject to subjugation. Uh, and this is the um, conflict at New Ulm, uh, not, not far from here. And I talk a little bit about the book, in the book about uh, what happened uh, in this area uh, in uh, 1862. I know you're going to have a lecture on that, so I'm not going to uh, get into that. Uh, but this was the uh, largest execution, largest mass execution in American uh, history. Uh, 38 Sioux uh, Indians in December of, 18, uh, of 1862. And they sent uh, General Pope, uh, who had failed everywhere else, uh, but um, he uh, succeeded in a way uh, here in, in Minnesota. But it was part of this uh, idea that this is our right by God. I mean, it's one thing if you feel, well, you know, this is right. But if you feel you're doing God's work, who can stand against you? And if they stand against you, they deserve to be cut down. But you know, wars have consequences. And the consequences are death. 752,000 men died during the Civil War. Millions more mourned their loss at home. And many of those who came back from the battlefield came back maimed in mind and body. Let me read briefly. War was death, and death was war. How to deal with its possibility as a soldier, and how to process its reality if you were a friend or family member. How do you die when you are lying helpless in the woods and the fire is about to consume you or a wild pig is tearing at your entrails or you have lost your legs to an artillery shell and you know you will bleed to death? Do you think about the Union, states' rights, God, your family? Or do you plead for someone to shoot you? Is it better to die as your comrade did this morning as you sat eating breakfast together and a mini ball crashed into his brain and splattered it over your plate? How do you die if you are stretched out on a hospital bed, sweating from fever and infection, while a young woman wipes your face with a cold cloth and you ask her, if you are going to die and you do not hear her answer. Or if you're moving in and out of consciousness, catching your breath at every draw and grasping water, and maybe your nurse hears Jesus because that is what she writes to your family. How do you respond when you receive a black-rimmed envelope bearing an official seal from Richmond? 
How do you respond when you are handed a letter from a stranger, a nurse, a comrade, assuring you that your husband or father or son died nobly for his country? Do you thank God? You know, I showed this to my class, and one of my students blurted out, that's Germany, 1945. No, that's Andersonville, Georgia, 1864. Well, the war's over, and soldiers came home. Uh, this is a common uh, northern homecoming. And of course, this, this was a common southern uh, homecoming. A uh, lot of destruction, of course, in the south. But the key issue of Reconstruction was whether the four million slaves would become full American citizens. And many white southerners were convinced that this could not, should not happen. Uh, and here you have uh, some white men uh, beating a black woman uh, who had uh, defied some convention in North Carolina in the late 1860s. Now I want to make it clear that this was not only a Southern issue, this was a national issue. Reconstruction did not fail. Reconstruction did not fail. Failure implies that it had a chance to succeed. It never did because most white Americans believed in the inferiority of African Americans. So there was never really any chance that African Americans would get their full rights during the Reconstruction era. Where, where did this lynching take place? Just take a guess. Where? Boston? Duluth? No, it was actually New York City. New York City. One of the points I make in the book is that racism was not a Southern thing. It was national. It was national. And Northern whites were deathly afraid that four million slaves would come up north, take their jobs, take their housing, take their daughters. They didn't want that. And they understood that. The election of 1864, the Democratic Party coined a new word. The word was miscegenation. I mean, we, it's fairly common today, but it was coined first in 1864 during the campaign. And the Democrats said, that if you vote for Abraham Lincoln, you're voting for miscegenation. Election of 1868, the campaign song for the Democratic Party, The White Man's Banner. This was a depiction in Harper's Magazine. Uh, Harper's uh, was probably the Time Magazine of the uh, era. Everybody read uh, Harper's uh, Weekly. And this was the South Carolina legislature. And what do you see here? Well, you see uh, not much lawmaking going on. But the uh, African Americans sure are having a good time. They're enjoying themselves. Uh, they're uh, drinking and carousing. And this is what happens when you allow African Americans to vote. This is what happens when you allow African Americans to hold office. And Northerners said, yeah, yeah, you might be right, because, you know, we have the same problem. Only our problems with the Irish. <laughs> and, and here it is. Here's a cartoon. Uh, the uh, gentleman to the right there is uh, Boss Tweed, uh, head of uh, Tammany Hall in the uh, Democratic Party in New York City. And uh, these are all the Irish voters uh, coming in to um, to cast their ballots. As Boss Tweed said, uh, it doesn't really matter who votes, it matters who counts the ballots. 
And of course, he's absolutely right, as you might suspect he retired to Florida. Um, Anyway, uh, he, here's a, a Thomas Nast uh, cartoon which sort of emphasizes what I've been talking about. Uh, the caption here is called The Ignorant Vote. And when Southern whites denied the vote to African Americans, the folks up north said, yeah, you know, we ought to do that with, uh, with the Irish. Now, Thomas Nast always depicted the Irish as monkeys. He racialized the Irish. And, and of course, the Italian immigrants, they were called what? They were called Guineas. And no Italian I know is from Guinea. <laughs> but again, racializing, in other words, uh, making the Irish and the Italian less than white or not white uh, at all. You can see black, white, north, south. The ignorant vote, it's the same thing. What were, Amer what were Northerners interested in then? Well, remember, uh, remember that Loitze painting, uh, Westward. Well, here's a new painting. Uh, um, Northerners were no longer interested in this manifest destiny business. They were interested now in technology. They were interested in growing the country. Uh, Lady Liberty, in her left hand, she is stringing telegraph wire. In her right hand, looks like she has a Bible. But if you look closely, it says school book. And uh, just on cue, uh, off on the left portion of the painting, the Indians are moving off the screen. The centennial celebration, 1876. Uh, it was a tremendous display of American technology and business acumen. Uh, New York City, uh, the fastest growing major city in the country in the, in the 19th century. Steel, Pittsburgh, two major industries appeared in the 1870s that did not exist before the Civil War, the steel industry and the oil industry. And of course, some of this technology went into the construction of the Great East River Suspension Bridge, also known as the Brooklyn Bridge. I understand the Minnesota History Center has it on for sale. <laughs> but anyway, um, and of course, our great heroes now are inventors. Thomas Edison. The age of advertising emerges and particularly targeting children. This rarely happened before the Civil War. And here's a scene painted in 1883 along the Mississippi, in Mississippi. And you can see the steamboat. And if you look carefully, there are black people picking cotton in the fields. If you had come to the same spot 30 years earlier, in 1853, you would have seen the same thing. So why did we fight this civil war? Why did we kill 752,000 men? Because the results of this war, particularly the liberation of 4 million African Americans, was woefully incomplete and remained incomplete for more than a century. Now, this year and for the next couple of years, we will be commemorating the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War. And we should honor, we should honor those men who died for their respective causes. But it would have been a greater tribute to our nation had they lived. Thank you.